Welcome to Student Manager 101 Names, the first of five. Yay, Chuck, how you doing? I'm excited, a redo. And again, we did uh, we did this for 7.2 uh, release, and now we're on 7.2A. So this is the latest and the greatest. And Lori, I'm excited about all the new features. So <clears throat> if you're ready, you can uh, give me control, and we'll be uh, off and rolling. So I'm ready. There you go. All right, good enough. Well, welcome, everybody. And uh, this is part one of five of our Student Manager 101. We kind of call it the boot camp <clears throat> on name records. Now, we're going to, since this is the first one, and, and some of you might be new to Student Manager altogether, we're going to start with a bit of an intro to Student Manager and then roll into what we aim to do, which is dealing with name entry. Uh, the people that are part of your program, that are essential, your students, your prospects, uh, what ACEWARE and student manager is supposed to help you track. So uh, for student manager in general, uh, our ACEWARE flagship program, uh, the goal is to help you do your job, uh, again, faster, easier, and more accurately. <clears throat> One of the big things that I talk about, and one I didn't mention in the slide, is say that you're not born, no one is born knowing how to run a database program. And the other thing related to that is that student manager is not an instrument, or it is an instrument. It is not a CD player or an MP for you youngins. So again, your involvement is required. Um, the user that is involved on the admin side is what's going to make the difference in terms of what you get as a program, as a school, as an organization, from your student manager investment. Now, you're not alone in this. You've got help. Certainly, your support technicians from here at ACEWARE. And there's always the online help, either on the website or at the student manager toolbar, the little red book. <clears throat> will give you help to operate the system. And the new student manager help guide, which if you've been a former, uh, been using manager for a while, um, is definitely one that uh, we've been updated. Cheryl has updated that. And uh, I think there's a lot of new, uh, new goodies in there and, and uh, more useful items for you to be able to work with. Now, I'm going to ask real quickly, and I, I'm looking over the list here. Um, the raise your hand business, and Rita's already got her hand raised up. I'm going to put everybody's hand down. Raise your hand if you have used Student Manager for less than three months, whether you're brand new or have used it for less than three months. Raise your hand. And um, so we've got a few in there. Very good. All right. Well, we're glad to have you aboard, <clears throat> and we will. Uh, uh, most of the rest of you apparently have been around a while. So we'll try to talk about what's new in the new version of Student Manager. For general operational benefit, Manager is really organized into three big, big things. The people, the names, uh, courses, the programs, the classes, the workshops you do, <clears throat> and then, of course, the registrations, which is a record of a person enrolling in a class. Now. Um, there are lots of other elements, but those are the big three. Can we call them the Holy Trinity? If we're looking at the toolbar now, <clears throat> the, the uh, colored icons address the different lookups for the various tables. We've talked about the names and the courses and the registrations. <clears throat> but the other main icons on the system are faculty lookup, add edit codes, uh, edit preferences, online help guide, and then log on a different user. Now, I uh, do not want to note, we will be talking about codes, I believe, in, I think it's the f last one, number five of the series. It is indeed. So um, navigating to move through the system, you can either click on the icon uh, to, to get you to where you want to go, or go to a drop-down menu to get to the area. To leave Student Manager, you would go to File and choose Exit, or you can use the X close in the upper right. Now, one of the things, the big, big things, is that when you leave your office, when you're done working with Student Manager, even if it's going to be for a long lunch, our recommendation is that you always close, you always exit out of Student Manager. 
And, and the reason for that is that so that if, if you don't get back to your office, student manager is not up and open for somebody who doesn't have the authority to or shouldn't be in the student manager data records to get in there. Now, one of the ways to do this, and I'm going to roll into manager real quick, is this um, log on element. If you're in student manager and you want to leave for a few minutes, rather than shutting all the way down, you can just click on the login. Now, that will lock the system so that the next person in, unless they know a password, can't get into the system. So you'd need to log back in in order to get back into the system. All right. Uh, edit. <clears throat> now kind of navigating across the menu bar. Uh, lets you copy, cut, paste of data. Now again, this screen, you, if you're not open in a data record, the undo, copy, cut, paste aren't going to be live. Clone name, paste name, preferences generally are on all the time. Um, module. Uh, typically, module from the menu is where most of the data entry comes from. Of course, that or using your colored icons on the menu bar. <clears throat> uh, names, courses, registrations, supplemental data elements uh, for the codes, the codes area that support the big three. And moving on, reporting area, if we, if we move across, again, we, we talk about the, the number of different areas, the number of reports. Tools, uh, again, depending on your role in the organization, you may or may not be a database, or not the administrator, we call them keeper of the flame, in which case you should be familiar with these particular tools. Uh, <clears throat> there are webinars in the webinar archive. Uh, that cover uh, the data management or data cleanup elements. One of the, and then finally, if we go to the last menu item, one of the big, uh, the big picture views is under help about student manager. And I will jump to that real quick because I do think that's something that's good to know. <clears throat> this gives you the number of records in each of your main tables, when they were last updated, tells you who you are in case you forgot, or in case you've gotten to a computer and you don't know who's logged on, and your main user level and where the data is. It also tells you when was, uh, what's today's date, that's the computer date. It tells you the version you're on, and it tells you a serial number and the status of your uh, credit card encryption. Of course, most of you on this, that's going to be blank because you're using a redirect. <clears throat> Okay, uh, let's 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 get with the program. Lori, any questions? Any chatter going on right now that we need to address? We doing good? Oh, everybody's happy so far. Good, good, good. All right. Um, entering names. Well, multiple ways to get in. Uh, again, you can click the plus button. Again, that's assuming you're going to add a brand new name. You can click uh, the menu items, module names, add new name. <clears throat> or you can use the keyboard shortcut, Alt-A. I'm curious, for you existing, you, you experienced users out there, raise your hand if uh, you use the, uh, the keyboard shortcut keys. That is the Alt plus A. Raise your hand if you use the shortcut keys a lot, Alt-A, Alt-L, Alt-J. I'm just kind of curious. <clears throat> we've got Jeannie. Jeannie's a, a short cutter. And we've got a few. Again, this is your preference, but the point is you've got choices in terms of how you operate the program. Um, customizing the screen. Now, we're going to be talking about this later, uh, but that um, within Student Manager, there is a preferences area that the program, that is the university of whoever you are, <clears throat> can turn fields on. Uh, you can enable fields. Uh, a number of uh, fields allow you to repurpose. We call them repurposing or relabeling. I call it the MASH approach, you know, cross out machine gun on the, on the requisition type in incubator. But if it's something that you need to use and you're not using the original purpose of that uh, field, absolutely you can give it a different label and use it for uh, different uh, purposes. And again, as I mentioned, we'll cover that more in the final uh, webinar of the series. Information about the screen. Number one, 
uh, if we're looking across, of course, data fields with drop downs are validated fields, which means yet you can only type data into the field uh, if it matches one of the approved values that whoever the administrator has set up. Pink brackets also indicate validated fields, although they're not drop downs. <clears throat> for the firm field, if you use that, and for zip code lookup or zip code validation. Um, the other thing we want to definitely emphasize is that if you have access to the use of the database for uh, being able to add or edit codes, uh, the plus sign on the screen means you can add a code on the fly so that you're able to add. Now, I'm going to, to jump over to Manager because We've talked about the uh, preferences and, uh, and uh, ability that you've got. This will cover under codes more, but again, password maintenance is where the system administrator would set up access to the system. <clears throat> the levels of access are set from one to six. So uh, zero is none, one view, two add. And so again, if you're a four or higher, you'd be able to actually edit the codes uh, for the record. And so when we talk about the ability to edit codes uh, with the plus button, that you'd have to be a level four to access that. And again, remember as a user, uh, what you, you see on a data screen, whether it's a name screen or a course screen or register screen, depends upon the fields that have been enabled in the name preferences area. All right, so far so good, Lori. Everybody's happy. All righty. Um, all right, let's move on into parts of the screen. Student ID number, and I will take a second and actually add a record uh, at the end of our kind of walkthrough to kind of hopefully make this all come together. <clears throat> the ID number on the, the name record is a unique identifier for that particular name record. And again, every different name needs to have a different ID in this number. Um, we're recommending that you make sure that is a nine-digit number. If you want to use a shorter number, pad it with zeros. Now, unless you have some particular reason that you want to create a private ID number, just leaving that, that field blank on adding a new name will student manager will create a unique ID number for you. The other thing to reference is that system generated ID numbers, you as a program, as a site, can define a, a letter or number as a prefix to your, to your uh, student ID number. And one issue here is that if you're a campus that uses multiple uh, databases, uh, Missouri State, there's a couple others who have more than one database, uh, we would recommend that you use a different site code for each different database that you run. Okay, uh, other fields, badge name, again, uh, can be used as a way to <clears throat> record a, a, a preferred name rather than your given name. And one big thing for student manager old timers is that in 7.2a, this is also now a repurposable field. So if you say, well, I don't need badge name, but I'd like to have the maiden name uh, so that it shows on the main screen, you could really relabel that, repurpose that field to store a maiden name. Uh, the other one is the don't mail field. Again, uh, the don't mail field doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad address but you can use it for the purpose of multiple addresses in a household. You can use the don't mail field to hide or suppress the multiple addresses um, if you're doing a mass mailing or your big catalog mailing. All right, uh, more extra fields. Uh, related to don't mail is the exclude field uh, next to the email. And again, if you've got a student who says, you know, hey, uh, you know, send me my email confirmation, but I don't want to get your big email announcements of the newsletter or how wonderful you are every two weeks, uh, so that that allows uh, the student, to, or you to respect the student's preference as far as not wanting to get promotional or general advertising emails from you. 
Uh, now that doesn't prohibit or preclude you. Uh, that was a terrible word. This still allows you, even if you as a student were to say, exclude me from your mass emails, you can still send that student emails for, again, business purposes, class announcements related to closings, related to information on their class. You're still able to do that. All right. <clears throat> More fields that are kind of cool. Source code. Um, again, the source code is you're tracking marketing codes. And I hope everybody's using source codes. I'm going to do everybody down, get to the hands of everybody. Raise your hand if you are recording a source code, tracking code, on your name records. Please let me see a bunch of names in here. Don't lie to me now. Don't. All right. We've got a bunch coming in here. And again, the purpose of this is so that you can find out what marketing codes, thanks guys, you can find out what marketing codes are the ones that are, or what, what marketing promotion efforts are generating the enrollments in your program. <clears throat> and so uh, to me, it is a big, big thing. And, and I really, really would hope people, uh, people record those. Interest codes, uh, again, um, you can identify, you can add a tag to a name record to indicate what types of programs Chuck or Lori or uh, Jeannie is interested in. Now, uh, as you add a subject code on a course, that will automatically populate in here for the student. But you as a staff user or the student, if they're enrolling online, can always add additional interest codes. <clears throat> and of course, this is critical to you, or should be critical to you, in helping to identify mailing lists, e-marketing lists, to communicate with your students. A um, couple more notes about the interest codes. Uh, we mentioned before, can add as many as you want. One of the cool new features, and we're going to hear more about this, we're going to actually try to get a special webinar on it, is the ability to scope interest codes. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and talk about, I'm going to roll to uh, a live copy, uh, well, the live copy of Manager, and bring up the interest code lookup. So uh, we're on a name record. We want to add an interest code. Uh, by default, <clears throat> all interest codes that you would have defined in your system will appear there. Now, if you've been around a while, your program has been around a while, uh, unlike Lori and I who've been around a while, there may be dozens. You could have hundreds of different interest codes. Well, if uh, you're trying to identify interest codes by category, you can do what's called a scope. When you create an interest code, you can assign it a category. First of all, you can create these categories. Um, you can assign an interest code a category. So if I'm a business and industry program person and I'm working with a student, I can click business and industry and I can only see the program codes that I've tagged as being industry related codes. So I don't have to search through an entire list of 50, 60, et cetera interest codes to find the one that I'm looking for. Um, so again, if I'm the health person, I can click health, just look at the health program. So again, Jeannie and, um, and uh, uh, Grace can, uh, between their program, they run adult ed and a health program. Uh, Grace can have the health program codes. Jeannie can have the general adult ed program codes and be able to uh, just look at the things they're interested in doing. And that really is useful, again, in programs where programs, that is, environments where you're using student manager, <clears throat> where you might have different actual departments or different program areas using the same database. And I can think of several, uh, like I said, Canton, SMU, uh, that are doing that. Um, the other thing about that, real quick, and I'm going to jump to the codes area, just to show you, because I just think it's that important, is that the new element is when you are editing interest codes uh, is that you can put the scope by element down here. 
So if you want to assign this to a particular category, uh, <clears throat> you can assign the scoping value to that particular interest code. Uh, the other thing that is particularly uh, helpful is that if you go into your profile, um, wrong one, if you go into the general preferences, there is a way that you can identify what is the default interest code identifier you want for user me. So if I'm that business and industry person, I'm going to put in B for business and industry. I'm going to close this and get back out. And when I do interest codes, look at that. The only interest codes I see are automatically just the ones that I care about. So again, I think that's a real sleeper feature uh, that you can use in managing the codes that you're using in your unit. All right, I hope that wasn't overdone. Um, anything going on, Lori? We doing good? Doing good? We're doing very well. All right. Um, Occupation and organization. <clears throat> Again, uh, kind of depending on the type of uh, programs that you run at your institution, if you're doing business and professional programs, this is probably more important to you uh, than if you're doing a community ed or a uh, enrichment type program. Uh, so again, uh, it's ways to help you track the people in your database to be used for marketing and uh, promotion and also to be used for uh, program development. And we can talk about that in, in some of the codes area. Now, note again, <clears throat> this is new in 7.2a, is that you can repurpose those. If you're a program that doesn't do business and professional, but maybe you'd want to know, I, I don't know, alum or non-alum, but you basically can, again, repurpose these two fields. Uh, for another use that mat might match up better with what you're uh, you're doing as a program. All right, uh, get back to here. Okay, membership tracking. Um, uh, this is this is new. Actually, came in in 7.2, uh, but the membership option it's it's part of the base system. You don't have to pay extra for it. Uh, allows you to track memberships, and if you've got an OSHER lifelong learning program or if you've got a, a, a friend of Genie program, that if you belong to this particular group, you can get discounts on classes. Uh, that's what the membership tool allows you to do, uh, or the membership system. And again, there is a special webinar in the webinar archive, which let me roll to that here now. On the website um, at aceware.com. By the way, are my screen refreshes good, Lori? They're doing. They're keeping up nicely this morning. Very, yeah. Very good. Okay. So, under support is a webinar archive area, um, and again, I'm going to bring it up, and then I'm going to have you tell me how many of you, if you would, let's get those hands down. Raise your hand if you have ever gone into webinar archives and looked at a webinar. I'm just kind of curious. How many real students do we have in here? Lots of them. Oh, that's great. Great, great, great. Uh, <clears throat> and again, uh, in the webinar archive are uh, almost 80 hours now of recorded material related to how to run the system. Now again, the 101 series, uh, this was 720. Uh, as we build the new 7.2a versions, we're going to replace these with 7.2, you know, 101, uh, what, A1, so that we'll put the new ones in here. And again, back in operations here, you'll note here's one, tracking memberships with student manager. So again, webinar in the system that you're able to reference uh, to use uh, in, uh, in um, managing whatever type of membership program you might have on file. OK, uh, any questions on either scoping? I would have thought that might have brought some buzz that we want to maybe cover before we leave interest codes. No. No. OK. All right. I, I did that good a job of covering it. A couple of things, again, if you, at the bottom of the student manager name record, um, again, uh, add date, update date, who did it, who was the last person, who was a birth mother, that's the data that's tracked automatically. 
when you save your work, and again, in terms of the, the toolbar at the bottom, a couple of things, let's just kind of review this. Uh, again, any button on this screen or anything you do on a, on a name record except undo, abandon, or hitting escape will save your edits. The save button, and what that does is saves your work. It writes what you've edited to the database, but the name record that you're on stays up. Um, the save close screen will also save the record, but it closes the record screen you're on. Now, big, big note, you do not have to hit save before you do OK close. It's OK, but it's double work. Uh, there is, you know, when you do save, it, or when you hit OK close, it automatically saves the record. So hopefully if you're, if you're doing save and then hitting OK, don't do that no more. Just do your OK close. Oh, come on. That's programmed in me to hit save first and then OK close. No, no, no. No need to do that in, in Student Manager. <clears throat> we got you covered. Undo and abandon. Now, again, same kind of behavior. If you're working in a record and you did something and screwed it up, but you haven't left the record yet, the undo key will allow you to wipe out anything you've added when you opened the record and started to work with it, and the screen will stay there. If you were just looking at a record and accidentally did some changes but didn't want to change anything anyway, then you just hit the abandon key and it will uh, bail out and, and not save anything you might have accidentally hit as you were navigating around. Fine. And of course, uh, this is another big one I notice people doing is that when they're in a name record and they want to go to another name, they'll do OK close, go up to the menu, do fine. You don't need to do that. When you're done with the record, you can hit a fine button, directly go to the next lookup, and guess what? It also saves your record. So again, you don't need to click save and then click fine. Sorry, Lori, that is unnecessary. And we're all about economy of scale. So again, <laughs> finding records. Uh, to find uh, to locate a name. Now, of course, most of the time you're probably getting find from the find tool on the top, but uh, <clears throat> uh, for either one takes you to the same place. So, navigating the window, and again, for new people, the idea is that you, people always want to find a field to type it in. They're, the find window is basically dynamic. So, the minute you start to type something, it will begin to appear in the blue find box. And as you type, it'll navigate to the first record in the row you're in the column you're on that matches up with what you're searching for. If you're trying to find a common uh, last name and they're a unique person, it's last name, comma, space, first name to get last name first. <clears throat> and then you tab to go to the next column. And once you're on the row, once you're on the line that has the record that you want, you either hit enter or double click to open the edit screen. And of course, as always, if you want to exit the window, press escape. Again, even though there's an X box in the nature of our system, it's escape that lets you abandon the find window. Uh, getting the timing down. You can set the number of seconds that the find window waits for you to enter the next keystroke. The default is 3.5 seconds. And I'm going to jump to live on that so we can say. So if I'm trying to find Havlicek and I do H, A, and let's see, was it V or H, A, L, V, or am I, oh, it was V. If I waited longer than three and a half seconds, you'll note that what I type in here goes away. Let's try that again. H, let me click into the screen. H, A, and I'm thinking, think once, think twice. Oh, it's V. Then I type the V. Because the three and a half second rule is passed, it says, hey, this guy must be wanting to look up a new record. I'm going to go look for the next letter he types. And that is the timing thing. Um, where that is uh, edited by, I'm going to hit Escape to get out of here is under Edit, 
my user profile is the pick list reset time. <clears throat> and again, that can be from one second to five seconds. Personally, I kind of like that mid-range, three to three and a half. Um, other things about the find record, well, we're talking about that. Again, if you have firm turned on, you're going to see a firm column here. If you say, well, I want um, Anderson and I want Carol rather, or Phil rather than a Adam or Bobby or Sam, so it's Anderson, comma, space, P, and that'll jump me to the name that I'm looking for. <clears throat> if you don't know the name, but you know the company name, Hollywood Productions, H-O-L-L-Y, it brings up the firm search, and you can then see all the people uh, from that particular firm. Uh, other searches are, if I tab across now, you can do it by zip code. Uh, that's kind of nice if you're saying, I wonder how many people we have in zip code 68. Well, the answer is one. So maybe that's not a very popular area for your database. Uh, <clears throat> another lookup mode is by day phone number and home phone number. And again, this is useful for checking family members or checking people who might work at the same organization. Uh, we're going over here and we see there are three numbers that are the same here, and by golly, they're all at St. Joseph Health Center. Well, maybe the person registered used his home address, but his day phone is St. Joseph Health Center. Uh, it would begin to give you an idea that you've got people coming from a particular company. Now, this also lets you search. So if I wanted to find the person who's from 537-2937, <clears throat> uh, I find that that happens to be an ASWR systems number. Uh, so again, a ways to look up a name record. You can do that also with the home phone number, 587. Um, and you can search by email address. Now, again, you'll note here in the left, I didn't clear long enough, C-H-U-C-K, there we go. And then you can do it by the ID number of the person. Um, and when you tab again, you're back to alphabetical search. All right. Uh, questions? Anything going on in there that um, we got going, Lori? We have questions. I'm going to hold them till the end. All right. Good enough. And, and I'm thinking we're rolling through. We should have plenty of time to do that. All right, let me get back to see <clears throat> what we've got. OK, the, the fine window. Um, I'm going to back off of the F5 key and go through an example. That's what my little prompt here is supposed to remind me, Lori, <clears throat> to get into doing a blank name. So again, uh, you can either uh, open a new name record with add a new name from module names add or the alt a shortcut. OK, a couple of things. Number one, whatever you type in the first name in the proper noun areas of the database is automatically uppercase. So if I start typing Joan, J-O-A-N, I did not have to shift, and I got a capital J for Joan. Uh, Smith, uh, suffix, that's junior, senior, MD, whatever. The grouping, uh, grouping element allows you to connect this record to other family members. And for community ed programs where you might have a mixed family of uh, different, cer different, is it surname, the last name, or the first name? That's sur last name, isn't it? Surname I forget. is last name. Last name, yeah. So that you might have Joneses and the Smiths, uh, they were remarried and they're, they're now an amalgamated family. You can use the grouping code to add other family members or make this person part of another family member. <clears throat> we're going to skip the title. And well, let's just say director. And we're going to say institute uh, of something, of something. Now, if you're using a firm and you have the, um, um, you're typing in a firm name, what it does when you tab out it checks to see if that firm name has ever been entered in the database. If it hasn't, it'll tell you what you can do. You said, well, wait a minute. It should have been Institute of Somewhere as opposed to something. You could reenter it. 
if you said, well, wait a minute, I thought I had an institute of something in there, you could do list and look up in the database of firms to see if I maybe abbreviated it, I-N-S-T of something. <clears throat> I know there is no institute of something in my database, so I'm going to go ahead and add it. And this then brings up the firm master record for that particular institute. I can put in a contact name, I'm going to put in the address, uh, and a second line of the address, and then I put in the zip code. Lori, what's your zip code? 30217. 30217. And by golly gee, it knows that is Franklin, Georgia. I could put in, if I know the uh, INST of uh, something, I can put in the URL, I can put in their main phone number, whatever it might be, I can put in the fax. Uh, on the firm side, and this is useful, you can put in what type of organization it is. Well, this happens to be uh, an entertainment industry. Lori has a, um, uh, teaches you how to be a great thespian over there. So uh, entertainment. Uh, how big is the company? Again, if you're doing business to business stuff, this is the kind of thing you can do is track information about the companies you do business with. <clears throat> She's got a small shop how many, what her size is, uh, and she's under a million, so we're, uh, probably so, right, Lori? Absolutely. Um, the absolutely. only thing we have a million of here is chickens. Is chickens, chickens and mosquitoes, so. Um, any ICS code, again, you can put in data there. Now, there is also on the name, uh, on the uh, firm record, the ability to put comments on this, uh, and one of the nice things about firms is if, if Lori's Institute was actually a branch office of the mother institute of some things, or the institute of all things, you could put in here who is the, uh, it's payable, at the address of P.O. Box XXX in New York City to, I said, uh, 0111, uh, that's Virginia, close, she's in the big city. <clears throat> but the point is, you could have a third-party billing address for the third-party uh, company that the person is tied into. So for billing, uh, that's kind of a nice feature. All right. Once I've added that institute, it automatically fills in Lor uh, Joan's address there. She's Lori's new hire um, at this particular location. And again, I can put in the email, js at INS.com, abbreviated email. I'll ask Joan how she found out about us. And she says, well, I was referred to you by a friend. And that's fine. And her occupation is an administrator. And again, you noted that her organization code was populated because the Institute of Something was coded as a entertainment organization. <clears throat> again, I can put in other information about her. I might ask, uh, could I have your birth year? And she'll say uh, 1980. So it would be, we don't care about the birth, um, the birth day and month, but if, we're, if you're trying to track the general demographics of your population, you can ask for birth year and just put in a 101 for the, uh, for the year. Um, all right, so that's basically the idea of a name entry process. Anything, Laura, you'd want to yeah, add on this? Leave there. Can you uh, answer a question by putting sure. in a zip code that has two different cities attached to it? 03246 is one I know for sure has. 032, well, when you, when you do that, if you've got the zip code database has all the cities as of a couple months ago in this. So when we bring up a zip code that has multiple cities, eh, it's Come again. Three, not 30. 03. 30. Oh, three. Oh. No, no, no. 03. 03. 246. Oh, thank you. 246. Okay. <clears throat> now, this is what it'll give you. It'll give you both cities, and by default, the most common city is the one that is the first one on the list. But you, as an operator, get to choose which one you're going to use. All right? 
that that solves the problem. <laughs> Good enough. Yeah. And again, I, you you can add a new zip code, although I don't know why the heck you would, because like I said, our zip code database is generally updated every couple of three months. Um, all right. Now, I'm going to add an interest code. I'll say, Joan, what kind of programs are you interested in? And she says, I'm interested in marketing programs. Um, and so we'll add her to the list there. Now what we also might want to do is say, Joan, I want to call you back in a couple of days to make sure that you've gotten um, the information. And, well, let's, let's uh, first of all say, what do, you want to, what do we want to send Joan? Well, we're going to send her the management flyer. So when I put in management flyer and label flag, um, that allows me to mark this name for a temporary label. And again, I'm going to do the, the hands up, hands down. How many of you that have been running Aceware Manager use the label flag in generating brochure requests or brochure fulfillment? Raise your hand if you use the label flag. Uh, it's a few. <clears throat> well, again, uh, if you've got cases where people are calling in and they're saying, send me the brochure, send me the catalog, if you use the label flag uh, tool, um, hold that thought. We'll get back to that. Okay, let's say also that we, wanted to, we want to be reminded to call this person back in a week to see if they got what they asked for. So I'm going to go to special, and I'm going to click callback. Uh, we'll cover special in a minute. Callback automatically puts your name as the user. I'm user Chuck. And it puts a date 10 days into the future to be, for you to be reminded to call this person back to see if they got what they wanted. Now, I'm going to change this date to today. And now, one of the things to note if you're a director watching this is that you can assign, and technically anybody can assign, so I said, well, I don't want to have to do this. I'm going to have my staff member, Rosie, call this person back in uh, X number of days. I'm going to set that back to me so we can see the pop-up. But if you're going to do Rosie, one of the things you should also do is put a note in the comments why it is you want to call them. And so that falls into comments history. The comments history area is where you have general comments about the person, you can put in a contact history note, and you can put in special needs. If you noted when we were covering my name record, when you pulled up Chuck, it said this guy's hard of hearing. And that's what the special needs field is for. Um, contact history, actually, if we get back to it, if we click on contact history, the shortcut from the special button, the nice thing about that is that it'll put in today's date me as the user, and what it is that I'm supposed to do. What I'm supposed to do. So for Rosie, it would be check to see if she received a flyer. Check to see if she received the flyer. All right. Um, anything else, Lori, you can think of here at this point? I think everybody's pretty happy. All right. So I'm going to save that record. And again, I don't have to hit Save. I can just hit OK Close. Or I could say, I'm not going to hit OK Close. I'm going to look up a different person. I want to find Mr. Gibson. Mel, my buddy. has Now, there's a special needs note. He's got some anger management issues. Because I haven't heard much from Mel lately. <clears throat> and that was coming from the special needs area. Um, now, for Mel, he's going. To, we've got a note for him to get the anger management brochure. So we've got that in there. Um, uh, the bottom part, and in terms of talking about the name record, this is the CRM tracking component, where we talk about uh, any time you, you generate a mailing list, any time you do a mass email, it allows you to make a record in here of what you sent to them or what kind of communication you had with the student. And that's done automatically. You don't have to manually enter that. Um, let me get back to my record here, Havlicek. Notice again, I didn't uh, 
didn't get into the person. I'm going to go ahead now and talk a bit more about the other tools in the system. Um, ad registration, edit registration, we're going to cover those uh, in the registration one, which I believe is our third one, right, Lori? Yes. Uh, but anyway, um, this, this allows you to edit your registration. Courses taken gives you a quick view of all of the classes the person has on file. Uh, quick reports gives you the ability to run several quick reports on the name record. Uh, the sort option is what determines the order in which you view this particular record. So again, right now it's last name, first name. So I'm at Havlicek, I go next, and we go from H to J, from J to J, Jameson to Jones, Eric Jones to whatever. Now if I'm going back here, <clears throat> there's a hard of hearing warning for Chuck. It's that, well, you know, I do mainly business to business stuff. It would be helpful for me to be able to look at these people in firm order. So I'm at Havlicek Chuck at Aceware. When I go next now, I'm going to the next Aceware person uh, sorted by company. So this allows you to move back and forth between um, all the different people in a given company. And again, you can change that temporarily. Right now, I, I change it temporarily. I do OK close, look up a record again, and it's back to last name, first name. And again, that can be, that is a system preference, though. You can change the order if you want to make that always last name or firm search. And you do that through preferences. And we'll bring up preferences here, names, and then under the default sort for the name screen, you can pick, you know, uh, firm name, firm ID, group ID, home phone. Well, typically it's going to be firm ID or probably last name, first name uh, as your defaults in this particular process. Um, okay, I think that covers that. I, I'm going to roll back to the slideshow because <clears throat> I kind of got uh, back. I'm going to be repeating a couple of things. Well, I still don't want to go there. Um, let's go back to the name record and look at additional information. Um, additional information is where you can define for your own program, University of whatever, how you might want to store, well, what kind of data you want to store, and how many of these fields you want to use uh, for your student record. <clears throat> so again, uh, these are user definable. The labels are global. Uh, but the use of the field is local. So again, uh, you can't have one person calling this field spouse and the next person calling this pet name. You have to all agree within the uh, user group for student manager what you're going to label these. Uh, but that allows you, uh, you're able to use those. A couple of things, and I'm going to jump to my record here in case you got to it. One of the things that you can do is also link files or pictures to an individual. And I'm going to, again, ask how many of you, hands down, how many of you are using the link file or the additional documents area to store data about an individual? Anybody out there? I'm looking, looking, looking. Yeah. Uh, Lynn's got it. All right, good deal. Vicky's doing some of that. Sally. Um, here's an example. On my record, I put in a link to a photograph. And so I can right mouse click on that photograph and bada bada bing. I have a perfect mouse uh, elimination tool for my office. Now, you can put uh, documents, you can put PDFs, you can put spreadsheets. If you've got things like um, resumes, if you've got things like an application for some program that you wanted a PDF and be able to link to it from the name record, you could do that through this document link tool. So again, uh, a great tool available to you. 
Um, financial aid is another element that is, again, part of the base system uh, where you can create financial aid elements. I know a lot of our career schools are using that. And again, there is a webinar on the whole financial aid piece uh, that's in the webinar archive. And we'll be probably doing some more tools on that uh, in a bit. <clears throat> or maybe another webinar on that coming up this year. All right. I believe I'm going to now get us ready for the next element, which is the Find Them tool, the F5 key. And again, guys, I'm going to ask a question. How many of you use the F5 key? How many of you have used it in the last month? Raise your hand if you have used the F5 key in the last month. All right. We've got our usual suspects there. That's great. Mike, Maxine, Lynn, super. All right. Now. If you have never used this key, you need to become aware of it. And what it allows you to do is that no matter where you are in the system, now I'm in a name record now, but I could be in the middle of a course. I'm in the middle of editing the instructor data, yada, 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 and, and the boss comes in and says, hey, I, you know, tell me where uh, tell me where Mel Gibson is living nowadays. And you say, well, I don't, I'm in the middle of this record here. Well. No worries. Press the F5 key. The person locator will jump up on top of whatever you're doing. And you can search, and this is the cool part, by bits and pieces. First name, part of a last name. Firm name contains. An address contains. So if you wanted everybody on Rainbow Boulevard, you could type in Rainbow and get everybody from that particular uh, city or that particular address or street. Ditto, email contains, <clears throat> city contains, email contains. So if I wanted, now we started with Mel. Let's, get, let's, let's do our thing here. Mel, hit the OK button. Mel Gibson, Mel Munchkin <clears throat> tells me who that person is, base information. And if you wanted the full record, double click on the name, and it'll bring up the full record. Abandon, escape, and I'm right back to where I was. Now, back to F5. Uh, email. So if I wanted to know how many people do we have in the system that have a Yahoo, um, yahoo.com email. <clears throat> and the, there are actually three that have a Yahoo email account. So again, multiple ways that you can look up people. This tool also allows you to export the file to DBF. You can export it to Excel. Um, you can change the sort order that you get the list of the names in here. You also can create custom conditions. <clears throat> so if I wanted to have actually a custom code for everybody who has an interest code of management, I can actually save that code, and you have to use a little bit of, of XBase or FoxPro code to come up with that. But your technician can help you with that. You can put it in, save it, and actually put a note in, if you look at the right, all folks interested in management. So you don't need to know code. You can go over and look at your little cheat sheet as to what that covers. So there's my list, all people in management. There they are. and I can choose if I wanted to export those, I could have exported those out, oops, I could have exported those out to an Excel file and, and manipulated them. Anyway, this is a real, if you haven't discovered the F5 key, I would really encourage you to play with that. Uh, again, there's the ability to add additional fields to view in addition to the standard set that we've got. Uh, this custom tool is very flexible. Um, again, a great tool for you to be able to use in, in locating your students. <clears throat> All right, Lori, we got a half an hour to go, and I think we're, we're rolling down. Uh, we got a couple of brand new features we want to highlight, and then we'll get into Q&A and hopefully have time to get into detail about what we might have missed or, or glossed over that people want to review. The credential tab, brand new in 7A is a new tab on the name screen that lets you record 
any kind of external data that you want. <clears throat> and again, we don't claim to be smart enough to think of all the ways that you as program users might want to work with this. Whoa, backwards, backwards, backwards. I'm getting nuts over here. But that um, it basically lets you expand your use of your name record in Student Manager in a lot of different ways. And I'm going to go ahead and jump to my record because I started to put some examples in there. OK, so on my name record in the credentials, I've added several different credentials. The type element here is where you can create categories of credentials. And again, that's like, what, a seven-digit field, eight-digit field. You can make as many different categories as you want. The elements in there would be a title or a name, two date fields, one field for a score, one field for a credits, one field for an institution or sponsor or host, and then a notes. And again, <clears throat> within that, um, you can kind of do anything you want. One of the nice things about this that Matthew added is the ability to filter. So if I wanted to know, I want to just look at the courses that a person might have on their file. There are then the two courses that Chuck has on his file. If I want to look at his employment history, you can do that with employment history. One of our visions is that this will be useful for career schools who are needing to track employment status of their graduates as part of the IPEDS and the government um, accountability issues. <clears throat> this gives you a tool. Now, we can't help you find people who disappear. But if you find them, you can go in and put a note as to what it was they did or doing. And again, like for score or credits, you could put in their, their salary. If, if, if this was a salary, uh, but the, the president is 50 cents an hour, uh, 56 cents, and I was actually making 5 bucks an hour there, and I wasn't even making minimum wage back then, which was 375. So you can put in notes, again, uh, referencing whatever the category that you're using for the system. Um, again, um, this has uh, reported, this can be reported through functions. We anticipate that probably uh, we'll be adding a report tool that has to do with uh, credentials uh, and or maybe even a shortcut key. Whoops, wrong one. Uh, maybe even a shortcut key to get us some reports. All right, so that is the new credential, cat, credential tab. Uh, some other helpful tips. Uh, clone name. Uh, didn't talk about clone name. Uh, but clone name, paste name is the goal here is if you are adding people who are from the same address, husband and wife, uh, mom and their kids, a company employee, and several other people from that company, you can use the clone name feature to do that. And <clears throat> by example would be the best one. Now, I just added... Uh, Miss Joan Smith, Joan. Now, I need it, the way the clone works is that you can manually go in and force a clone. Now, if you go in and edit Joan F. Whoa, Joan F. Smith. I have edited Joan Smith. The last record that I edited or saved with an edit or an add will be the record that is in the to be cloned mode. So right now I'm going to add a new record for Miss Thompson. Lori Thompson. I'm not sure you're in the database. Now, this is showing the Lori Thompson at Aceware Systems. Now you'll note when I typed in Lori's name, it automatically looked in the database to see if Lori Thompson exists. And it says, well, here's one with Aceware. Well, this is not the real Lori Thompson. So this is the second Lori Thompson. So we're going to hit the Escape key. And now I can go in back to the name record. <clears throat> now, at this point, I can, and if Lori is with the Institute of Something, I can paste the name 
and it'll automatically carry forward all of the base information from the last record into Lori's record. So again, great way to speed enter people who are being brought in. Now note, the email of the last person is brought over automatically. So if you are, uh, got, if they have a private email, you'll need to edit that. And so anyway, that is the cloning. Now I see a label flag that I haven't cleared yet, so I'm going to go ahead and do OK close, and let's illustrate. We're, we're segueing back to the label flag now. Under demographics mailing labels is a box called print marked labels. When you do that, it'll automatically pull up all of the names that I have marked with the print label. Tell us on the form what it was that we want to send them. And then when you send that to the printer, it asks you, are you ready to reset the print label flag? And if you answer yes, it'll clear all those flags so that tomorrow when you start entering data, and we'll look up Ms. Smith to make sure, that flag has been removed. And tomorrow when Fred Smith, Joanne's sidekick, wants a brochure, They'll mark his name for a label, and it'll appear in tomorrow's set of labels that we need to deal with. So again, I think that's really a useful tool if you guys you know, put it into play. That was a clone name, name with the segue to mailing Josh, labels. Go ahead, Lori. Can I ask? Maria has sent me an entire paragraph on this subject. <laughs> and she'd like to know, does it re basically, I'm, I'm paraphrasing for yeah. you. When you do the, the label flag, does it? make any kind of notation in the CRM area? I am not I, I am not sure about that. I <clears throat> will just go to Ms. Smith and take a look. And the answer is at this point no. Um, now I believe that let me take a look at the demographics mailing labels. Right there. If you now and I, I take that back. If you have record CRM entry on, now you noted I had it off. If you were to turn that record CRM entry on, it will make an entry, is what I'm going to, uh, to suggest. <clears throat> and um, so, um, so that is uh, what you need to turn on in order to get a CRM entry automatically entered. We'll let Matthew weigh in on that or get back to you if, if that's not right. OK? Thank you. All right, let's see what else we've got. Um, and we talked about the last name added, edited. Uh, blacklisting. Uh, this is something in the emailing. If you've got a person who is really, really hacked off at you, and they've threatened to bring down the wrath of uh, the lawyer and the, the almighty on you, if you send them any more emails, you can add a name to a blacklist. Uh, now, this has to be enabled through the preferences area, uh, but it does allow you to basically put particular people's emails on a blacklist so that if you deleted them and then some other staff member added them unknowingly and didn't know that they have three lawyers ready to sick you guys, um, you, you can be warned about that. Special button, we kind of covered the special button before with the shortcuts. Um, temporarily change sort order. We have covered that. Quick reports. And, uh, and again, uh, in the name record, quick reports, uh, you're able to generate a report on the name record. Uh, and again, you can make multiple reports, fax, number 10 envelope, a letter, a transcript. And again, the idea is a quick report for that particular name record. Uh, label flag, we, we, we've covered the label flag, uh, super tool, callbacks, um, I put in a callback for myself. <clears throat> and so what would happen on that is that, again, now I, I need to reference preferences again. Because depending on how you have preferences set up, you've got to be able to say, use the callbacks and go back X number of days to check on the callbacks. And if you don't have that turned on, you're not going to see, uh, you're not going to see that name pop up. <clears throat> so 
when I would log on to the system, it would automatically do this check for me, list student callbacks. And it would bring up on the 12th or whatever day I said I wanted it, Miss Joan Smith, who their firm is, their phone number. And if I put anything in the call note or the history, and you'll note memo, one is lowercase, one is uppercase. If you have an uppercase, that generally means there's data there. And just hovering over the uppercase M will tell the user what is supposed to happen. <clears throat> and there's nothing in call note. And again, if I wanted to go in and say, well, you know, I don't remember this Joan Smith, or if I'm Rosie and I want to really find out what's going on, I can double click on the name and get the full uh, history of whatever might be entered on that particular person. So that is the callback. And again, note it is also available for faculty and courses. Copy name, all three. Again, I'm going to ask you guys, make me happy. Tell me, raise your hand, if you have ever used the Alt 3 to copy and paste a name address. Name and address. All right, we've got some coming. Good, 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 good. Eh, eh, not as many as I would hope. <clears throat> Why do we care about this? Well, the idea is that if I'm working on a name record, I have Miss Thompson here. Thompson II at the Institute of Something, and I wanted to write her a, a, a letter, a, a formal letter, going to be actually with the postage stamp on it. <clears throat> By holding Alt and 3 down, Alt 3, it will copy the name and address and phone number and email of Miss Lori. Um, now, um, I'm going to segue here. You saying, well, Chuck throws out these shortcut keys. How am I supposed to remember these? Well, remember two things. There's a help guide. The other thing is that from help, <clears throat> there is a keyboard shortcut button that gives you a quick shorthand to the various shortcuts. Alt-3, copy name to clipboard. Alt-Y, copy instructor from name. Uh, again, different tools available to you related to that. OK, Alt-3, I have Lori's name and address on my clipboard. So if I were to go into my computer, open up a Word doc, and my documents, let me see what I've got that I'm not going to embarrass anybody with. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, let's go with uh, Dean and Directors. I've got to find some. Here's a Word doc. I don't know what. The... And if I wanted to go in and put in Lori's name as the header of my, of my Word doc, I go in and just Alt-Control-V. And there is Lori's address without me having to type it or flip back and forth. OK, it's address. And then I jump back to my address. Alt-V, paste it in there, <clears throat> and it's ready to go. All right, uh, Alt-3. Uh, email the student, again, with the email module. Double click on the email address. You can send an email, multiple emails, typically a comma. And uh, Lori, that depending on what your email you're using, some of them use semicolon, and, some, and most of them use co uh, comma. So you can you can see what works for you. Combining names, the good and evil twin routine. You basically copy the ID of the good twin, go to the ID record of the evil twin, paste it in, and the on-screen prompts will take you through the combined process. Um, all right. Questions. Um, what, 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 do we, what do we not cover that we need to cover? I'm thinking we got most everything in here this time. Lori, let's, let's start working through the list. All righty. This one is just going to take you, take you forever to answer. Can you run a report based on interest codes? Uh, yes. <laughs> and, and again, the interest codes um, in, the, in the help guide <clears throat> Basically, of the reports in here, demographics, names of codes, mailing labels, those would be the two big areas. Uh, but the, the interest code area is one that really is available in a number of areas, and we've even got some special tools to do that. So absolutely, you can run lists and reports on those interest codes. You betcha. You betcha. Uh, can you reorder the columns in the find window? 
No. Uh, well, I take that back. Uh, temporarily, you can. Uh, when I, there's a default order that the system generates. But if you said, now, now one of the dilemmas is that if you have a screen, let me see if I can do this here without screwing things up. Uh, no, hang on a second, guys. Stay with me. Okay. If you've got, again, if you've got a monitor that is too short to show all the different elements of the screen, and you're saying, I'd really like to see the email of the person and their name, you can drag over to the right, grab the email field. Come on over here, email. Get over. Click in here. Okay. Tab, 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 tab. Oh, because I've got the screen. I can't fake a. I can't fake it. Here we go. But when you are at the column of the email address, you can you can click on the column, drag it over, and temporarily reposition it. So now I have the email address sitting right next to the name. Now, when you leave the find, it will reset back, but you certainly can move it around temporarily. The other thing you can do is size the display. So you say, well, I'm not as interested in the firm, but I'm really interested in the city, state, and zip. So what you can do is just squeeze. You notice I'm clicking on the bar between the address and the, or the two columns. I can squeeze that data in so that it allows me more things viewed in this particular session. Now, when I close this and go back to find, it resets back to the, the typical normal display. So, so in a way, yes, uh, but, but not permanently. Okay. Um, Kim knows that in her zip code table, there's a city that's misspelled, 44406. Right. How does she fix it? Okay. Uh, real quickly, you would go to your zip code lookup, find the zip code of the offending um, uh, city, and you said Burke should be Burke E Y. Hit the Save button, and that's it. So basically, you go to your zip code lookup under Module and edit that. Very good. Uh, we did not talk about fee categories. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, my, my my success at getting some of the the features, but fee category <clears throat> on. The name record, well, I have fee category turned off. And that's kind of an illustration. I really ought to have that turned on, because that's a nice feature. So I'm going to go into Preferences, Names, and turn on right here, alphabetically, fee category. All right, now let's go back to the name record. Have a check. So now, fee category. The fee category is for you is that if your program has special fee categories for different types of people, <clears throat> if they're staff, if they're a senior citizen, maybe they're a student, there's a resident or non-resident, uh, alumni, that if you go in and assign a fee category to a person, all right, you got that, and you go in and create courses, I'm going to put 12F, asterisk student manager. Oops, I don't know where I did that. Uh, 12F. Let's go to processing credit card. that you'd put in whatever category from the student side would give him or her the best rate based on how you typically price out these discounts uh, in setting up your courses. All right, Nick, does that work? That seems to work. 
somebody asked, did they hear you say you could record two emails for somebody? And yes, you can say that. Right. And the idea is that if I've got two emails, I can put in a comma. Typically, it's a comma. I mentioned it could be a semicolon. Chuck a square at Gmail. And then when I were when I was when I would do an email blast or or double click to send an email, and I probably oh I don't have the email module on this demo. Sorry about that. But when you bring up an email, this would actually send to both emails uh, when you when you go to send uh, an email to that person. Okay. All right. Uh, does the system automatically generate the ID number in the upper right hand corner? Absolutely. Yeah. And if you noted Ms. Smith, and that's what we were talking about here, is that this ID number, I didn't touch the ID. When I just hit save, it automatically put in the next unique ID number uh, for that particular person. Okay. Uh, can you show the shortcut list? Again, please. I'll Again, that is the F1 key or going to help keyboard shortcuts. And for there we go. Help. And I've got something here that's locked. Oh, I've got too many screens open. Okay. F1 key. Uh, and that's again under help keyboard shortcuts or F1 is your shortcut key. And again, that is also available. You can go to the help guide and 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 search for it and find it. All right. Okay. I'm looking Lots to of see good if questions. We have, uh, well, we, we may be about done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, can you walk through a combining name, please? Oh, sure. I think I've got somebody in here. We've got Avery, my buddy Avery. Good twin, evil twin. And actually, I'm going to, I'm going to cheat, guys. I want to, I'll show you a backup. This is outside of the normal routine. But um, I want to save my data with the evil twin in it before we uh, before we get rid of her. So I'm I'm jumping to do a backup. <clears throat> I'm going to use this data for my uh, uh, demo that we're going to pass out to people. So uh, looking up uh, a name record, we've got here the Avery sisters, and we'll see here's Lisa Avery, an evil twin. Here's Lisa Avery, the good twin. And I'm going to put in a pager number, or I'm going to put in a pager number for the evil a cell number for the evil twin, three one five one 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 two three two three. Oh well, whatever it was. Okay. So the rule is, you go to the evil twin. Uh, no, good twin. You go to the good twin. Good twin over evil twin. You copy the ID number of the good twin. Now, uh, I'm going to segue. Hang on, guys. Some of you may say, well, my number has hyphens in it, and when I copy that, the hyphens copy over, and it doesn't fit in. OK. My recommendation is, since most of you should not be storing social security numbers in that ID field anymore, that you go into preferences, organizational defaults, or your admin person for your school, and set your social security number format to open text so that people don't think it's a real social number, because that's really not where we ought to be putting it anyway. So that will give you an unformatted nine-digit number. We're going to copy that number, back to copying, copy the number. We're going to go to the evil twin and paste it. Now, when you do that, several things happen. We're, we're, we're worried. OK, are you sure you want to do this? Yes, we know we want to do this. And now it tells us. This has been assigned. What do you want to do? Do I want to edit this other evil twin's record? Do I want to re-enter the ID because maybe I screwed it up? Or do I want to combine names? Well, we want to combine. And then it tells us all registrations, all interest codes, all worldly possessions of the evil twin will go to the other name. Continue, ka the Evil twin is marked for deletion, and the good twin has owned all of the interest codes. You'll note the evil twin cell phone. We even inherited that from the evil twin. So it, it carries that data forward. 
great way to combine tools. There is, incidentally, in the utility program that comes with the student manager, a mass merge purge so that you don't have to do this one by one if you do if you've never done cleanup and you've got a whole bunch of duplicate names in the system and contact your ASWR tech for that. All right, other questions? What other got things got things you have? Uh, can you also do good twin evil twin on businesses on firms? Uh, yes, uh, same same rules apply. Uh, from the firm edit module firms find firm. Uh, if you've got, I don't happen to have a couple that are close here, uh, Institute of something, and but the, what you would use is the firm ID. So the firm ID, you could find the Institute of something and the Institute of anything, copy paste, and it'll say, do you want to merge? And it will do that. Now, one other thing I need to mention related to that. There are in the database tool set, data cleanup, there is a utility that does firm, com, firm combining. So you can say, give me all of the universities. <clears throat> now, all of mine are unique, but if you had Kansas State University or somebody entered it, the University of Kansas State or KS State University, you could select multiples of the same institution and then combine them uh, with this combined tool, uh, which incidentally also works for um, codes, uh, catalog codes, code areas, locations. Uh, there's even an address cleanup tool that's part of the maintenance uh, of the system where you can proper case names and addresses if you're running ACE Web, that is letting students register online, a lot of times students are sloppy. They'll enter all lowercase on the web or enter all uppercase on the web. Uh, this allows you to proper case those. Doesn't affect their login and password, uh, but it's a, it's a cleanup tool. All right, Lori, what else you got? OK. Uh, you Regarding the two names in the email address field, if they are, if the student is using AceWeb, will it recognize the second name? That is a problem, and the answer is no. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to say somebody to chime in on this. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to lean over my shoulder at, at Cheryl here. If you're using two email addresses in Student Manager, you can't log in to AceWeb with the second email address, can you? Nope. Right, and will it do the first if you're using two, or do you have to get rid of one and only use? Okay, all right. So, <clears throat> what uh, the, the the official word on that is, if you're using uh, two email addresses for the person, the first one is the one that would be their email login, uh, and you could have a second one, but AceWeb is not going to recognize it. New at uh, C O M. So again, uh, only the first one is recognized for AceWeb logon. All right, good questions. Any others going on? And again, uh, again, if you've got questions about your data on that, uh, obviously your first resource is certainly uh, calling your technician or sending Lori and I an email, and we'll either answer it or forward it to your tech. But again, that's up there. They're here for. And certainly, uh, you know, we're here to help you make this system work for you to get your job done and let you go home at the end of the day and feel like you've done a good uh, a good service to the people in your community. So, gosh, that sounded uh, like I'm running for office, didn't it, Lori? Anyway, <laughs> oh, so much. I, I was thinking you had become rather uh, political. <laughs> no, no, no. And I think we have reached the end of our questions. Very good. Well, this was a, a good session. Uh, lots of elements that we've covered in here. Uh, remember, our next webinar is next Wednesday, uh, the 10th. It is 1030 Central. Same link that you came in on this one. We'll get you there. <clears throat> and we'll now and we'll then get into courses. That is a, another 30 minute or a 60 minute one, right, Lori? Yes. OK. Uh, now, there's going to be a lot of ground to cover, so be on time. We will start, and we will go 100 miles an hour because there are, again, excuse me, lots of data to cover on the course side. So, folks, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for coming back uh, again today. 
Uh, this will be recorded on the web, and uh, we'll see you next week. Have a good day, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.